All right, shall we open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 6, verse 39. Aside from John, most of the other gospel writers really, after an introduction, pick up with John the Baptist's arrest and Jesus' coming into prominence in the second year of his three and a half years ministry publicly before his death. And so that's certainly the case with Luke. We uh, have moved into that second year of the Lord's ministry. He has chosen 12 apostles. He has called several men to himself personally. And he has gathered together them as well as a crowd of people that would certainly now number into the thousands to begin to tell them the gospel. How do you get to heaven? And why had he come? And to confront all of the religious kind of belief systems, all of the convictions of men's hearts, and to convince them that there was only one way to heaven. And that way is the way of the cross. We had started a couple of weeks ago, in fact, it's been five or six weeks now, in a sermon that the Lord taught, and it is the first one that we really run into in Luke, to the thousands of people that were gathered, as well as these newly appointed apostles. And the purpose of the, the sermon was what all of them are, really. To bring you to a place where you realize you can't please God on your own, you need a Savior, you, you know, you're, you're, have a sinful heart, you need to be changed. To bring you to the place where you're kind of on your knees looking for help. And so as we started this sermon, we, we've gone through a, more quickly than we would have otherwise until we get to these places where the Lord is speaking, and then every verse means something, so we've slowed down. Next week, we'll finish this sermon on the level place that the Lord uh, presented to the people. But needless to say, that's what we've been going through. In fact, last week, Jesus spoke about the fact that we reap in kind, and he, he said to the, to the crowds, if you don't judge, you won't be judged, and if you you know, if you don't condemn, you won't be condemned. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven and all. And so all of those things just to get you to the place where you go, man, I can't do this. And then the Lord said, just be as merciful as your father has been to you. Just seek to be like the Lord that you now depend upon. Well, this morning, as we get towards the end of the sermon, we're going to start in verse 39, just stop at verse 45 or so. But the Lord turns again to speak to us about something that I think all of us should keep in mind, and that is, the Lord saved you for more than getting you to heaven. Oh, that's the ultimate goal. But if you're here anyway, he'd like to use your life. He'd like to use your life to communicate to the world around you that there is a Savior who has come and given his life, and that really the, the purpose of your life after coming to know God is to be useful to his plan. Jesus will say in John, herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. And certainly the greatest work you can do as God's people is to be out and about winning people to the Lord and teaching young believers to be mature ones. Since we're getting close to the end of the year, this might be a really good study for us to evaluate how fruitful we've been this year. How have you done this year in being a vessel that God would use. And what do you plan to do next year? Because reaping in kind also applies to making disciples. The chief goal of every saint, of every church, of every pastor should just be that, to bring people to the Lord. One of the last things that Jesus said that Matthew records is, he said, you go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all of the things that I have commanded you, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. In other words, <laughs> marching orders. It's great to be in church and pray when you're sick and, and bless, be blessed when you're blessed and share and sing and be happy most of the time. But that's really not the goal. The goal is, you know, get to the laboring field. Get to the fields that are wide on to harvest. Get busy serving God. You've probably all had a, or a job application, and one of the things when you apply for jobs is you, you want to put your best foot forward. Oh, I've done this, and I've done that, and, you know, and then they'll say, can I call your former boss? You go, no, that'd be a bad idea. You, know, you don't want them to know where you've come from. Well, the Lord would say to you, how did you do serving your false gods? And you say, oh, I did really good serving my flesh. Great, so how are you doing serving the Lord now that he has come to save you? Because to shed light 
And this is the lesson for this morning. You've got to be in the light. If you're going to pass the light along, you're going to have to be walking in it first. And, and spiritual fruit is passed on or gathered first and foremost by it being seen in your life. And then once they see it, teaching it and, and seeking to emulate you, then you can embrace it. But until you see it and then, then you can hear it, really nothing gets accomplished. So Jesus taught us here this morning about how we can be spiritual heroes or, if you will, laborers in the Lord's army. Who's looking up to you this morning? Who in, in your life wants to be more like Jesus because that's what they see in your life? Who is, who is following you? Or, if you will, how are you following the Great Commission to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature? That's literally what you want to, what, what you want to be able to look back on and look forward to. There really isn't anything else that you're going to accomplish. I don't care how well you, you do in business or as a parent or, you know, in your community, your civic leadership. What's going to matter is what are you doing for God's kingdom now that he has saved you? Did, you know, <laughs> I, I've said it before and I, people don't like it, but I'll say it anyway. I don't care. <laughs> if, if you're just going to get saved and go to heaven, we might as well just hold you down at the baptism for a long time. Don't even bother letting you up. What are you going to do anyway? Hey, just stay down. But you see, God does let you up <laughs> because he's got a work for you to do. That's really what these verses have to say. Verse 39 says this. He spoke a parable to them that said, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not then both fall into the ditch? This word parable, and you, you, have, you will run into it a lot in the Gospels, is really a teaching device that the Lord uses. In fact, the world will use it as well, but not in the same with the same application. But it is usually a fictional narrative of common life that is then set before us so that we could understand a spiritual truth that you couldn't otherwise see with your eye. So it's a physical story set aside a spiritual lesson to help us understand it more easily. This graphic kind of proverbial image, can the blind lead the blind, was already in circulation long before Jesus used it. You will find it in ancient literature well before the first century. But it is one of those, and, and maybe that tells you something, the Lord took things that people understood already and, and used them to teach others. But it is a sad and telling tale and a phrase that, Jesus will use this phrase again later in Matthew 15, when he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, those who had been leading people astray, and, and uh, he, he made them angry, but he said to them, you know, they're blind leading the blind, just leave them alone. They're going to both fall into the ditch. In other words, don't follow his, their, you know, spiritual or religious kind of ways. God's people can only be fruitful, great commission, bearing fruit, bringing others to him, but you can only bring people as far along to the Lord as you are. There's no way you can push them ahead of you. God wants to do more in your life than save you. He wants to use you. He wants to speak through you. He doesn't want you to just sit in the pew. He wants you to get in the battle. And if we are to be successful in accomplishing that desire from the Lord, we're going to have to first be very selfish with our own spiritual well-being and grow in God's grace first. Serve that first. There, this is the biblical correction to do as I say, not as I do. And the Lord would really say to this crowd, if you're not walking with God, where are you going to lead anybody? It doesn't work that way. By definition, the natural man, the one who doesn't know God, is blind. Right? Paul said to the Corinthians very clearly, the natural man does not and is not able to receive the things of God's Spirit. They're foolish things, foolish thing. he cannot see them, they're spiritually understood. So in the world, there's no answer for spiritual needs or spiritual direction. You have to turn to the Lord and to his spirit. And we know that that blindness alienates us from God. It, it is accomplished by sin and and it is perpetuated through unbelief and the influence of the devil himself. In Isaiah's day, as the Lord was speaking to the, to the spiritual leaders, 
the Lord warned them in no uncertain terms that within 90 years down the road that this entire uh, nation would be taken into captivity. But, but in warning them, the Lord said to them, here's why you're in such danger. Your watchmen are blind. They're ignorant like dumb dogs. They just can't bark. They just lay down and sleep. They love to slumber. There's no leadership. There's no spiritual direction. You are, you are doomed because of that. And it's certainly the case for us as well. Jesus will speak here of the need to receive from him before we can go out and pass along from him that which he would like others to hear. In reality, a very uneducated, spirit-filled individual is far more qualified to teach spiritual truths than the highly educated, natural man with his PhD. You have more insight, you have more answers for spiritual needs than a world who's just lost in sin. Even the religiously trained man whose head is full of Greek and Hebrew languages, who's well-versed in church history, who can um, quote whole passages of scripture verbatim, he's not walking in those truths. He is of very little use to God's kingdom. God can't really use that, nor will he. And yet he said to us in John 16, I think it's verse 13, when the Holy Spirit, or when the Spirit of truth has come, he's going to guide you into all truth. He's not going to speak of his own authority, whether he hears, he's going to speak and he'll show you things to come. So one of the sad practices today, unfortunately, if you look around churches, is that there is this tremendous moving away from the Bible to become more contemporary, to be more relatable, all of a sudden, the Bible becomes this old stuck-in-the-mud past tradition that we don't really need for ourselves any longer. And it is certainly uh, a, a scary thing to see that, that the Word of God is being replaced by the wisdom of men. It is, it is the result of, you know, and as a result, as you'd say, the pulpits are filled with very unsaved, worldly educated sinners leading churches that are filled with well-educated unbelievers. If you go to many seminaries today, and all you have to do is search them out on the internet, there's a tremendous movement amongst religious circles today for higher criticism and modern thinking that absolutely begin to challenge just the very truths of God's Word. The movement to, you know, by professors, many of them teaching Old Testament classes saying that, you know, these Old Testament stories are not to be believed literally, these seminaries, or as we like to call them, cemeteries, they begin to question the virgin birth. They begin to question the deity of Christ or the hope of his coming. It's not new, but it's dangerous. Because if you and I are going to have an impact upon the world, if we're going to lead people to Jesus, we've got to be close to him and know his word so that we can pass it along. He blesses that. When Paul showed up in... Um, in Ephesus, and he, he stood among, among those Epicurean philosophers there in Acts 17. It says that when Paul looked around the city, he was so provoked in his heart that the, the city had been given themselves over to idols. And so he went to the synagogues. He began to reason with the Jews. He, he even dealt with the Gentile wor worshipers. And then he went out into the Agora, out into the marketplace, and, and he began to talk to these philosophers, the Epicureans, the Stoics. And he began to just share with them the Gospels. And they began to say to one another, Who, what is this babbler saying? It sounds like he's proclaiming some kind of foreign God. And so it says that Paul was preaching to them the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So they invited him up to Mars Hill there, up to the Areopagus. And they said, well, tell us this new doctrine, because there's such strange things that you're telling us, and we want to know what these things mean. But then Luke writes in his commentary, these Athenians and these foreigners spent their whole day just sitting around either hearing or telling something new. Unfortunately, that's the way it is in the church today in so many areas. People just want a, something new. And, oh, there, have you heard the latest? Well, there is no latest. In the Bible, everything is old and absolutely important and might as well be seen as new because it is indeed the way that God gives to us his life. As far as salvation goes, God's salvation is always accomplished by two things, his word and his spirit. 
You want two tools? Keep his word, keep his spirit. The new arguments, the new, the new approaches, it's, it's nonsense. I mean, God works in a million different ways, but when you reduce everything to how he works, it's by his word and by his spirit. It's how you got saved, and that's how those who will hear you will get saved as well. I think it was, was John, he was in his 90s when he wrote 1 John, and he said to the people, the anointing that you've received from him now abides in you. And you don't have any need that any man should teach you. The same anointing that you have received will lead you and guide you, will, will teach you, and will abide in you. In other words, it isn't that God doesn't use teachers, but, but, but understand where the source comes from. Your, your relationship with God depends upon his word, depends upon his spirit. Others can bring that word to you. And you, you should be a vessel for that as well. But it's going to require his work in your own life. I really think that the explanation for the tremendous success that Calvary Chapel Ministries have had over the, the last 50 years has been just that. The fruit that comes from teaching the word, trusting in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And in fact, Paul told Timothy to avoid any other approach. His first letter to him there in chapter 6, Paul said, if anybody teach anything otherwise than these things that we've learned and uh, these wholesome words of the scriptures about Jesus and the doctrines which you received according to godliness, get away from them. They're proud and doting and they're knowing nothing. They're corrupt in their minds. They're destitute of the truth. They suppose godliness is gain. Just get away from that approach. Can the blind lead the blind? No. If you're going to be someone God can use, you've got to be in the light. You're going to have to know what the Scripture says and stand upon it. Paul, we are told in Acts 19, as that, you remember as Paul was casting out demons, there was a couple of Sceva sons. In fact, there were seven boys, I think, who, who had seen Paul casting out demons, so they tried to imitate him. And the demons were pretty smart. They said, well, you know Jesus, we know Paul, we don't know who you are. And so they jumped upon these men and, and beat them and overpowered them and prevailed against them. But then it says that in the Ephesus, all of the people saw what was going on. And, and Jesus' name was being magnified. And people were burning their sorcery books and confessing their sins. And then it says the word of God grew and multiplied. That's how God works. What are you going to do next year for the kingdom of God? You're going to have to be in the light. You're going to have to know what you believe and are able to share and have, have great confidence in it. Then we can accomplish God's will. Jesus often likened the church to sheep, which honestly, not a compliment always. They are the world's dumbest animal. They easily get lost. They have no homing sensibility at all. You can lose a dog, and 50 miles later, he's, he's found you. Yeah, I thought you were trying to get away. I know where you are. <laughs> Not a sheep. You go around the corner, and the sheep doesn't see you. He's lost. You go over the hill, and you get out of sight. He's going to start crying out loud. They are, though, prone to follow sound. So most sheep herds have bells around their neck. Hey, there they are. Hey. They follow the sound. But if one goes off the cliff, dinging on the way down, you could lose the whole herd. No sense of danger. David wrote of our Lord that he would lead us beside still waters, which is good because sheep can't swim. And yet without hesitation, they'll dive in and be swept away. They make for great children, though, because they follow their shepherd. I'm not asking any questions, Lord. I'm just following you. A life God can, you must, can use must begin with a life that knows the Lord well, that knows his word well, that is able to communicate what they've received. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, You through your commandments have made me wiser than my enemies, and they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all of my teachers. Your testimonies are, are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. I keep your precepts. I've restrained my feet from the evil way, and I am keeping your word. That's the person that God can use. 
You first become a partaker, then you become an imparter. Blind leaving the blind, that's not going to work for us. And so the Lord uses that well-known parable. And then says in verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. At best, a disciple will, will turn out like his teacher. Your effectiveness in the work of God in discipleship is, is determined by the extent that you've become a disciple of Jesus. You're only going to be helpful to help people get to where you are in your walk. We have folks all the time, and unfortunately churches are filled with that kind of lack of commitment where people want to be in charge. I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And then you say, well, you know, we'd like you to see a church, and they'll go, <laughs> that's a hassle. And we have meetings, you know, four times a year. Oh, I don't know if I can make those. And it would be great if you could just show up to pray once in a while and, and make a meeting. We'd love you to be an example to others. No, 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 I just want to be in charge. Great. We missed you at the baptism. One of the most important things we can do in the church. We missed you at our annual picnic where we can hang around together and just minister to one another. No, no, I just want to be in charge. Well, Jesus here plainly says that our discipleship of others will never take them further than we can go ourselves. So you do want to have people in charge that are running ahead, not lagging behind. You want to be that running ahead individual. You don't want to just come and sit and leave. You want to be able to look back and go, Lord, what have you done with my life this year? How's the kingdom benefited? The early disciples had a reputation. They were called Christians first by their enemies. The enemies of God called them Christians. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 4, uh, I think it's chapter 4, that they noticed Peter's boldness and that of John's, and they said, well, these are uneducated men. These are untrained men, and yet we take notice of them because they've been hanging out with Jesus. You see, it's all about your relationship with him. Then you can begin to affect others. Until then, there's not much we can do. The teacher has to lead by example. We have to be the most committed ones. And you and I have to be the most committed ones to the cause of Christ so that then God can use our lives. His example is our mark. How is my life conforming to Jesus' will? How is that going to help others? Now, we've come a long way. Hopefully, some of you can look back and go, man, I'm not at all the person I used to be. And God has really made some great changes. Paul was 30 years old as a believer, or 30 years old as a Christian, if you will, when he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. I, I still have much to do, but I'm putting off the things that are behind. I'm pressing ahead towards the high mark of the calling, uh, the upward call of Christ. I, I just, you know, I've come a long way. I've got a lot to do. <laughs> so often you hear from people after they've been around the church for a while, well, I know everything now. Well, they don't say that. They just act like that. Hey, buddy, come to church on Wednesday night. No, no, I've gone through that book extensively on my own. Okay. I know that already. But your walk will reveal the extent to which you've made yourself a disciple. And, and not only that, it'll set a mark for how helpful you're going to be to someone else, how fruitful you're going to be in this life. Certainly the most important aspect of your walk with God is the authenticity of your commitment to Christ. I don't doubt that these words of encouragement from Jesus would help these newly appointed ones, you know, when the Lord said, I'll help you, I'll, I'll, I'll just stay close to me, stay in fellowship with me, I can use you, I, you can be my vessel. But how can the blind lead the blind? A, a disciple, at best, is going to turn out like his teacher. If he's perfectly trained, the word perfectly is the word teleos, it just means maturely, or has, has grown to the level that he has been called to. And then he says in verse 41, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that speck in your eye, when you yourself don't know or don't see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite? Well, come on, Jesus. Really? Hypocrite? 
first remove the plank in your own eye. Then you'll be able to clearly remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. You got something in your eye. To minister to others, we have to have a pretty good view of ourselves. If God's going to use you, you're going to have to see yourself for what you truly are. Back in verse 27, he had started talking about that, that change that God would bring in your life. If you, if you were humbled and hungry and forgiving and merciful, just like he is, then indeed God could use you. To be an eye doctor, if your eye doctor is blind, that's dangerous. <laughs> and that's kind of the way the scribes and the Pharisees operated, right? They, they didn't know where they were going, but they were just prodding and poking and, and criticizing and stumbling people in, in the process. By, by definition, a speck is a microscopic particle, at least in the language, that irritates the eye that you can barely see, but it's there, and you know it, and you got to get it out. And if we are going to be blind to the truth about ourselves, we're in no position to help somebody else. Jesus spoke a parable to the scribes and Pharisees in Luke chapter 18, and it is introduced by the words, he spoke a parable to them who thought they were righteous while despising others. They didn't see themselves clearly, but they didn't see you clearly as well, because they had a blind spot. Once the Lord's grace comes into your life, you can begin to extend that grace to others. But until you're, you're in a relationship with the Lord, there's no humility in your life. There's just self-righteousness without a proper, proper sense of, of my own personal sinfulness. And, and yet I can see other people's faults clearly and judge them accordingly. But if I am dead to myself, if I see myself as one who needs God's help, God's forgiveness... Then I can begin to minister to others. But the Lord said, you know, your brother's needs oftentimes are far less than your own until you see yourself clearly. The word plank here is the word for joist or timber or, or four by 12. This is the kind of thing in your eyes that you're dead now. <laughs> this will kill you. It goes right through your head. If you're blind to the truth about you, you certainly can't be helpful to others. Once you see yourself clearly, then you can begin to minister to others. Then you can begin to reach out to others. But only those truly walking in God's forgiveness and fellowship with God know the price the Lord paid and, and, and the grace that he showed. It's hard to, to offer to others what you don't have. The Lord calls that hypocrisy. The word hypocrite, by, by biblical definition, is just an actor who puts on a mask with a smile or a frown or whatever it might be. But it's not him. It's just a mask. He's a hypocrite. It's, it's not what you don't see what is truly there. It's not the way the Lord would have us to be. So, unless you've been touched by the gospel, you're not ready to preach a solution to anyone. So that's why the Bible teaches you to be selfish first. In other words, be very selfish with your own spiritual well-being and then be very willing for God to send you anywhere. When Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy in chapter 4, I think it was verse 16, he said, Take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. And to the, to the doctrines, commit yourself to the truth that you've known. If in so doing, you will save yourself and those who hear you. How fruitful have you been this year? Maybe it's because your spiritual life isn't been as important to you as it should be. And if you're not growing close to Jesus, probably you're not dragging anyone along with you to get closer to the Lord either. Because you can't, you know, you like to push them ahead rather than just lead them. And, and let's face it, a leader is, is people, if you look around and people should be following you, that makes you the leader. If you're looking over your shoulder and nobody's following, you're not the leader. He goes on in verse 43 and he says, For... For, that's a connective word, continues the thought, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Every fruit is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, they don't gather grapes from bramble bushes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, while an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil but it is out of the abundance of his heart that his mouth will speak. 
Ultimately, the fruit that comes from my life is an accurate reflection of my walk with God. To the extent that fruit becomes obvious and the work of God's Spirit becomes clear, it, it, it defines for me what kind of tree I am. The moment I gave my life to Jesus, my life became a good fruit, a good tree. Now, it takes time for fruit to grow, but if I'm planted by the, where the Lord is, if I'm planted by the rivers of life and brings forth its fruit in its season and the leaves not withering, whatever he does, so prosper, Psalm 1, then over time we will see. And, and notice here in the verses that the fruit, which takes time to develop, will eventually let us know what kind of what person it is or what kind of tree it is. But I want to point out the long-term <laughs> fruit because people judge people in about three seconds. But over time, a person's life can certainly define where he's coming from. Jesus told, used these exact same words, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five, uh, 7 of Matthew to say to the disciples, you can tell the difference between a true and a, and a, a false prophet by the fruit that comes out of their lives. But again, fruit takes time. I'm sure you know that false prophets usually don't tell 100% lies. They usually, for a while, look like angels of light telling 95% of the truth. In the long run, however, fruit is the proof of God's work. And John saw that. You know, when John wrote 1 John chapter 2, he wrote in, in verse, I think it was verse 19, they went out from us, speaking of those who had walked away from the faith, for they were never of us. For had they been out of us, they no doubt would have continued with us, but they went out to show that they didn't belong to us. Over time, things will tell. What kind of fruit is, our, is in our life? It depends in great part upon how much we've grown close to the Lord. You can't be blind and leave the blind. You've got to be changed and saved. You've got to have the, the plank pulled out of your eye. You've got to have a good understanding of who you are standing before the Lord and what your life is like and what you're depending upon. And then you can start to bear fruit because going out into all the world and making disciples is, is not the job of the pastor. It's the job of the church. That's you and that's me. So what are we doing? What are we doing to affect this world in our speech, in our attitude, in our purity, in our commitment to the Lord, in a hunger for God, in our behavior, in our deeds, in our time commitments? God is looking to work through us by his word and by his spirit. Fruit will depend upon the tree. Harvest will reveal what kind of fruit it is. You don't pull out grapes from a bramble bush. The fruit of your life is the abundant evidence of the condition of your heart. Out of the abundance of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks. Which is why we read chapter 3. I don't like that chapter. But I want the abundance of my heart to be speaking in a different way, don't you? Jesus uses this very same statement, by the way, not in the Sermon on the Mount, but in Matthew chapter 12. And then he ended those words by saying, whatever idle word comes out of your mouth, well, you'll be held account, and your words will either justify or condemn you. So, to those disciples that he was training, he said the mouth and the heart and the life reflect the relationship that you have with God. So how are you doing this year? If you had to list your accomplishments, maybe you can list your stock market losses this year. <laughs> or your 401k debacle this year. Maybe you can quantify, you know, your retirement plans for the next few years, whatever it might be. But how about you go through and say, here's the spiritual fruit that, have, that God has been able to produce in and through my life this year. As I've gone out to the byways and the highways to be a witness for him. Being a spiritual hero, to shed the light, you got to be in the light. How about you? What are you going to do this year? How's it, it's going to be the best year ever for every one of you, I hope. I hope it is for me as well. That's my prayer. Father, thank you this morning that you are continuing to, to challenge us, to shake us, to, to confront us with, Lord, our, our spiritual lives, that you don't want us to just sit, that you have a plan for each of us to go forward. It, it is a plan to 
make Jesus known. It is a plan to have the gospel preached. It is a plan to shine as lights in dark places, to be sent as, as sheep among the wolves, to be wise as serpents while we are gentle as doves. You have made great plans for the church. But Lord, help us to not devalue all of those plans of sitting in church for 40 minutes a week and putting our Bibles in the trunk and see a Sunday, same time, same place. May you stir our hearts to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to disciple those who are, are needing to be helped along as we grow, that we might help others to grow. And that in so doing, the church might not only continue generation after generation, but the fruit of, of, of faithfulness will, will, will abound to, to the glory of God. Lord, use us this coming year. As we, if we look back and don't see much fruit, may that change. If we look back and wish we'd some, do something different, may this be the year that we do something different in you. And may it begin with our devotion and our love and our and our hunger and dedication to our God. As you fill us, may you then pour us out. But may we not be so empty that there's nothing to pour out. Work in us, Lord, so that we can lead others to you, we pray. 